I want to thank Professor Fabian Banas, President, Columbian Association of Gastroenterology, to invite me to speak at the prestigious 2023 Columbian Group on Inflammatory Bowel Disease. I'm so sorry that I cannot be with you in person in Cartagena, Colombia, but I'm honored to present to you my talk titled The IBD Epidemiology, Where Are We Going? As a gastroenterologist from the University of Calgary, whose research program focuses on global epidemiology of IBD, I'm going to share with you how epidemiological trends in IBD can be used to prepare healthcare systems across the world for the rising burden of IBD. Please review this slide that includes my disclosures, potential conflicts of interest, and land acknowledgements. The goal of my work is to establish the current epidemiological framework of IBD in the Western world. Contrast that rise of IBD in newly industrialized countries in Asia and Latin America, and forecast the global impact of IBD in 2030 and beyond. The purpose is to prepare healthcare systems across the world to meet the challenges that patients with IBD and society will face over the next decade from the rising prevalence of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The focus of my research is to answer this question. How do we transition from a handful of cases to millions of people afflicted today? To answer this question, I want to explain to you the evolution of IBD. In order to understand the origin of IBD, we must recognize that the evolution of IBD involves four epidemiological stages. Stage one, emergence. Stage two, great acceleration in incidence. Stage three, compounding prevalence. And stage four, prevalence equilibrium. Every country in the world is currently in one of the first three epidemiological stages and over time will shift through all stages. The first stage is disease emergence, whereby after thousands of years of very low number of cases or possibly non-existing disease, IBD emerges in society. The next stage is an acceleration in the incidence of IBD with relatively low prevalence. Incidence the number of new diagnoses made of IBD annually, whereas the prevalence is the accumulated number of people living with IBD in a region. This third stage is called compounding prevalence. In compounding prevalence, the number of newly diagnosed patients with IBD begins to plateau into a coalescing incidence range, but the prevalence steadily climbs, putting a great strain on the region's healthcare system. Over the next few slides, I'll contrast the timelines of these three stages between the Western world, North America, Western Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, as compared to Asia and Latin America. Try to explore the underlying determinants of these drivers, I'm also going to reveal a fourth epidemiological stage called the prevalence equilibrium, which is yet to come to fruition in any country. Now, why is understanding the four epidemiologic stages in the evolution of IBD important? Because if we can predict the future stages, then we can prepare our healthcare systems for the changing volume and demographics of the IBD population over time. I want to start by explaining how we acquired the data to define epidemiological stages. This journey started in 2012 when my lab published a systematic review on over 260 population-based studies on the incidence and prevalence of IBD. Sue Ng from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and I updated this analysis focusing on the time period 1990-2014, which we published in Lancet. And in collaboration with Dr. Ng and IOIBD, supported by Helmsley Charitable Trust, my lab presented at DDW in 2023 in Chicago, our updated analysis of over 480 published studies on incidence and prevalence of IBD across the world that spans 100 years from the 1920s to 2020. Collectively, these data point a picture of the epidemiological patterns of IBD over the past century. The 1950s, post-World War II, is considered the start of the great acceleration of human civilization, denoted by exponential global growth in human population. The rapid population rise was driven by economic advancements, automation, increase in food production, and profound resource and energy utilization. In parallel to this growth, the incidence of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease exploded in wealthy westernized countries during the last 50 years of the 20th century. During the last half of the 20th century, the vast majority of studies demonstrated statistically significant increasing incidence in the Western world. In contrast, few population based studies on the epidemiology of IBD were published in the 20th century from developing countries outside the Western world. Now, the turn of the 21st century heralded, heralded a paradigm shift in the incidence of IBD in the Western world. Since 2000, incidence rates have shifted in North America and Europe, with the majority of studies showing stable or falling incidence of IBD. This scatter plot shows incidence at per 100,000 from over the last century for Crohn's disease. The purple symbols represent data from North America, Europe, and Australia. 
We can see that at the turn of the 21st century, the incidence of IBD in the Western world are predominantly coalescing in a range of around 5 to 15 per 100,000 for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We call this the coalescing incidence range. However, incidence trends are varying by subgroups. For example, incidence continues to rise for pediatric onset IBD, whereas the greatest decline in the incidence is among those who are diagnosed with IBD in adulthood. Importantly, some of the countries of the Western world continue to report rising incidence, but in most of these countries, the incidence, arriving, the incidence of IBD is rising towards a coalescing incidence range rather than past it. Even though some countries are reporting higher incidence rates, importantly, it appears that that ceiling for incidence is somewhere between 30 to 40 per 100,000 for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This is in contrast to the green symbols, which represents newly industrialized countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. While the incidence of IBD is overall lower than that of the Western world, we can see that it is rising in newly industrialized countries. In the 1990s, most countries report incidence well below 1 per 100,000, with incidence rising to 8 per 100,000 in more recent times in some countries in Asia and in Latin America. The fundamental question is, will the incidence of IBD in newly industrialized countries mirror the progression of IBD in the Western world during the 20th century? In other words, 15 years from now, will the green dots eventually occupy the same space on the scatter plot as the purple dots? If so, the implications for countries like China and India with populations over uh, sizes over a billion people, this is going to be very profound. Now, take it. An example, Colombia, which has amongst the highest quality and informative epidemiological data in Latin America. This is an interactive figure that shows the incidence of ulcerative colitis in green, which is much higher than Crohn's disease uh, in gray. Uh, in 2017, the incidence of ulcerative colitis was 6.3 per 100,000, uh, and Crohn's disease was about 0.8 per 100,000. The incidence of 7.1 per 100,000 of IBD overall approximate some of the countries that we see in Europe today. Now, below here is uh, prevalence. Prevalence of ulcerative colitis is in the orange, uh, Crohn's disease is in the purple. In total, the prevalence of IBD is 67 per 100,000, or 0.07% of the population uh, in Colombia in 2017. Now, how do we recognize a transition from stage one emergence to stage two acceleration and in incidence? Many countries in Asia made this transition in the past generation, such that the epidemiological research allows us to witness the transition across stages. Take Malaysia, for example. This is an epidemiological study from 1980 to 2018, showing the incidence of IBD, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. The incidence of IBD, the blue line, was very low, below 0 0.5 per 100,000 from the year 1980 to 2009. After 2009, we observed the transition from stage one to stage two as incidence tripled to 1.5 per 100,000 by 2018. Importantly, the prevalence of IBD is considerably higher in Kuala Lumpur, a metropolitan city, as compared to the Kinta Valley, which is in a rural region. However, when we compare the prevalence of Malaysia to a Western world country like Canada, we can see that the prevalence of IBD in Canada in 2018 dwarfs the rates observed in Malaysia in 2018. Hallmark of stage two is that the incidence of IBD is accelerating, increasing, but the prevalence remains low. Canada's prevalence dwarfs Malaysia because we've experienced decades of rising incidence compared to only a decade or so of stage two acceleration of incidence in Malaysia. Countries of the Western world, North America, Europe, and Oceania, are currently in the third epidemiological stage called compounding prevalence, whereby after decades of steadily rising incidence, incidence starts to stabilize, but Prevalence rises dramatically. Compounding prevalence occurs because IBD is primarily diagnosed in young individuals, the disease is chronic and incurable, and mortality is low. Someone living today with IBD in their 30s is highly likely to be alive in their 40s a decade from now. So gastroenterology clinics continue, continue to add IBD patients to their clinics every year, but few ever leave those clinics. This is a heat map displaying the prevalence of Crohn's disease. The y-axis is countries from newly industrialized countries to early industrialized countries of the Western world. The x-axis is decades from 1950 to 2020. You can see a transition from stage one to two to three. As your eyes focus on the top right-hand corner, you see that the prevalence is consistently increasing across time, and in particular, among early industrialized countries of the Western world. 
The Canadian Gastrointestinal Epidemiology Concern, we like to call ourselves CanGeek, is a group of IBD epidemiologists who developed a population-based IBD surveillance cohort for provinces um, across country, including British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland, comprising over 95% of the Canadian population. Data from CanGeek has shown that the prevalence of IBD is roughly 0.8% of the Canadian population in 2023. Today, over 300,000 Canadians live with IBD. Using historical temporal trend data, prevalence of IBD was shown to have increased by approximately 3% per year throughout the 21st century. Forecasting models demonstrated that the prevalence of IBD will climb to nearly 1% of the Canadian population by 2030. This means that in a decade, our GI clinics will be caring for over 400,000 Canadians with IBD. But it's not just the sheer number of IBD patients that will challenge gastroenterology clinics. Approximately one out of every 88 individuals over the age of 65 in Canada is living with IBD. Seniors now represent the fastest growing demographic living with IBD. Why is that the case? Well, first, every day, gastroenterologists diagnose new cases of IBD in the elderly. Second, our IBD population is aging. This group faces age-related comorbidities such as diabetes, cancers, cardiovascular disease, dementia, making, making IBD more challenging to manage as our patients age. Now, as our IBD population ages, we'll eventually reach the fourth stage prevalence equilibrium, where the prevalence stabilizes and even declines. The prevalence equilibrium is the point where incidence of IBD approximates its mortality. That is, the number of new diagnoses is the same as the number of people who die from IBD. I want to highlight the tug of war between incidence and mortality on prevalence by sharing this sync analogy. During the second stage of accelerating incidence, environmental and economic factors churns the faucet to drive up incidence and prevalence. Even as incidence decreases over time, the sink, the prevalence remains high because new cases continue to be added to the base. Prevalence will continue to climb until the drain opens up. That is, mortality increases due to an aging population. Today, the proportion of seniors with IBD in Canada is the highest than it has been in any time in history. Someone with IBD in their 60s in 2010 is likely to be alive in their 70s in 2020, but the probability of being alive in their 80s in 2030 is lower just due to the natural fa uh, factors of aging. The net effect of an aging IBD population in the Western world is that the rise of prevalence will decelerate and it may eventually stabilize or even decline. So how close are we at reaching the prevalence equilibrium in Canada? So our labs created a compartment model using data from Canada that factor into the changing demography of age over time. By manipulating future incidence rates, we can see what happens to prevalence rates over the next few decades in Canada. If incidence were to increase by 1% to 2% per year, prevalence will continue to steadily climb over the next few decades. This figure is the national incidence data in Canada. It shows that incidence of IBD was measured to be roughly 29 per 100,000 in 2015, and it's actually forecast to remain stable over the next decade, such that the incidence of IBD is, is estimated to remain at around 31.2 per 100,000. So with a stable incidence, what happens to our prevalence models? Well, prevalence starts to plateau over the next three decades. But what's most exciting is that if incidence declines by 1% per year, we'll see a slowing in the rise in prevalence. And a drop by 2% per year will lead to a decline in prevalence over time. And this means that efforts to prevent the development of IBD has the potential to dramatically impact the rising burden of IBD. This is going to allow us to have a number of different factors that are going to potentially improve our understanding in terms of the complexity of IBD. We all know that IBD represents uh, an interaction between genes, environments, and microbes. Um, probably, uh, if you look back in the last 20 years, some of the best discoveries we've had is the genetic underpinnings. We identified over 200 genes that make people susceptible to Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Most of these genes represent proteins that are involved in our intestinal immune systems, interaction with our intestinal microbiome. We've also recognized that environmental factors, particularly ones that ex occur with exposures early on in life, potentially modify the diversity and composition of the intestinal microbiome in such a way that modifies the effect of developing Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in the future. So what can we do with this information to potentially prevent the increase in development of inflammatory bowel disease? Well, we're starting to see some really exciting research around things that we can do at a population level that might actually have an impact 
in reducing incidence of ulcerative, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Environmental modification strategies that prevent IBD development are paramount in reducing the overall burden. The potential for lifestyle and dietary changes in preventing the onset of IBD has been shown in observational research. For example, a cohort study of the domains of the Healthy Living Index, and this includes nine different domains, such as um, having minimal alcohol consumption, um, having a healthy BMI, uh, having uh, physical activity, never smoking, uh, eating greater than eight servings of fruits or vegetables per day, um, increasing the fiber in your diet, increasing nuts and seeds in your diet, uh, and reducing uh, red meat while increasing fish per week. Among those who followed seven or more of those nine domains, the incidence of Crohn's disease uh, may be reduced by upwards to 50 to 61%, and ulcerative sort of colitis by 42 to 56%. So I want to finish my talk by summarizing the four epidemiological stages in the evolution of inflammatory bowel disease. In summary, IBD serves as a case study on the evolution of modern diseases. Every country in the world is currently in one of the first three epidemiological stages in the evolution of IBD, and over time will shift through all four stages. Understanding the transition from the current epidemiological stage to the next stage is paramount to prepare for the evolving burden of IBD over the next decades. Developing countries are currently in the first stage of evolution. Some challenges for developing countries include recognition of IBD, appropriate training of clinician, and advances in healthcare infrastructure. As countries, economies advance and societies show greater westernization, the incidence of IBD will rise throughout the 21st century. Now, most newly industrialized countries in Asia and Latin America are entrenched in the second stage where incidence is rapidly rising, but prevalence is low. If these regions follow the epidemiological patterns of the Western world, they will transition into the third stage over the next decade or so, whereby prevalence will begin to rapidly climb. The Western world is in the third epidemiological stage as, and is anticipated to cross towards a prevalence equilibrium as its IBD population continues to age. Over the next decade, gastroenterologists in the Western world will contend with an escalation in the number of patients living with IBD by simultaneously managing an aging population. A concerted focus on the prevention of IBD could drive the decline in IBD incidence and ultimately decelerate the rising prevalence of IBD across the world. In the meantime, developing newly industrialized regions and countries of the Western world all need to innovate their current healthcare delivery to address the evolving demographics of their IBD populations as they transition across epidemiological stages in the evolution of IBD. I want to thank you for the opportunity and privilege to present for you today. Please feel free to email me at ggkaplan at ucalgary.ca. If you have any questions, if you want to reach out to collaborate on studying the global epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you.